Hey guys. All right, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we'll start in a few minutes, give people a few more minutes to join. Great. So thank you everyone for joining our webinar today on the missing link to mastering a modern identity program. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you in the next few days. During today's webinar, Paul DeGraff, industry renowned IAM expert, will lead a discussion with Jonathan Edwards, Senior Director of IAM Strategy at Secure IT Source and Kathy Christensen, Senior Solutions Advisor at TechZeta, on the growing reliance of third parties and the impact this has on identity and risk, as well as the challenges presented by current processes and systems when providing sufficient contextual identity data. They will wrap up discussing the key considerations that are needed to make a well-informed well decision about provisioning, verifying, and deprovisioning de access. If you have any questions at any time during the presentation, please write them in the chat box and we will go over them at the end of the webinar. And with that, let me turn the webinar over to Jonathan. All right, sorry about that. Struggling with the unmute button there. So uh, thanks, Nikki. I uh, appreciate the uh, introduction and thanks everybody for, uh, for joining today. Um, you know, before you know, I get into the trends and, and where identity is headed, I, I think it would be helpful for our audience to understand uh, who Security Source is and, and what we do. Uh, so Security Source is a full lifecycle identity consulting organization. Uh, we help customers strategize, design, and implement uh, identity programs. Uh, we partner with uh, industry best in breed solutions to support organizations' identity programs. And we've worked with a, a wide range of organizations which span you know, many verticals. And because of that, we're able to gain uh, insight into how certain industries see identity uh, and what the trends are uh, in the space as a whole. So as we, you know, as we look at, you know, what identity looks like today, you know, we see that there are very clearly defined processes for different types of identities. You know, whether they are employees, contractors, customers, consumers, vendors, uh, or even robots, you know, organizations first reaction is to implement a set of policies and procedures uh, for each type of identity. And their justification is that each identity type uh, has its own set of unique needs and requirements. And as that may be true, the process and functionality that has notoriously been associated with a single type of identity is now expected for all types. So, you know, just a few years ago, organizations, you know, never would have thought about exposing APIs or SDKs to consumers so they can have direct access into their infrastructure. You know, the lines are being blurred between identity types and organizations are, are looking to unify their identities and manage identities as just that, uh, identities. So as organizations unify their identity, they're rapidly seeing the value uh, of this type of approach. Um, the first uh, is that this allows organizations to simplify their processes 
And by unifying, uh, they can start to implement open standards such as OIDC or OLA2, uh, which creates standards and repeatability across the organization. You know, this in turn allows them to more effectively determine the right approach for gaining access to their service offerings. Uh, secondly, this helps reduce friction for users. And when users experience friction uh, while trying to do their day-to-day -day activities, or even when external users are trying to gain access, it can drastically reduce the productivity of that user. You know, users expect to be able to access you know, what they need, no matter where that service resides. So whether it's on-prem, it's cloud-based, or even SaaS, you know, users have become accustomed to a certain level of usability outside of the work lives, and they expect that same level of self-service inside of it. Uh, by not having a unified identity approach, you know, this can limit what an organization can provide to their user community. So all this is expected you know, while still improving security. And by unifying identity, uh, security policies and procedures can easily be defined and maintained. So I just spoke about security and the next aspect is, is really about reducing the overall security blind spots. Uh, security teams, you know, I think everybody knows that they've always struggled with gaining visibility uh, across an organization. And you know, this is mostly due to departments uh, operating in a siloed manner, shadow IT, uh, non-unification or lack of standardization. Um, and again, by unifying identity um, and identity related processes, uh, security can now have a single pane of glass to monitor how access is given, how it's maintained, and how it's removed. This also allows them to work you know, more closely and more effectively uh, with IT to build controls around their processes. And then lastly, it helps reduce the time it takes for services to go out to market. As standards uh, are implemented and unified identity stores are put in place, uh, developers no longer need to focus on security or managing identity. They can now focus on what they do best and, and that's develop. So ultimately this allows the business to provide you know, better services to their customers, uh, whether they're internal or external. So although the trend is for organizations to move toward a unified identity program, you know, there's still concern about regulatory requirements. And it, it seems like every day new requirements are being released. And the biggest aspect of these requirements is really focused in personal identifiable information or PII. So this is pushing organizations to start looking at separating identity management from access management. The organizations want to push the management of the identity back to the user. This potentially allows users to have more options uh, on their identity provider, um, and it can even allow them to you know, determine what attributes uh, they want to share with the organization. The organization can reduce the risk by reducing the PII that they have to manage and turn you know, their focus towards you know, policies and procedures that give access to users. So although it's obvious value in this methodology, um, it's still a journey. And how you manage third-party users um, you know, really can be the first step in maturing your identity program. You know, traditionally, organizations uh, manage third-party users uh, directly through HR. The problem with this approach is that you know, these identity types can uh, have some complexity uh, in which HR just might not be uh, built to support. HR can struggle with how to correctly classify or manage uh, these types of users, which can result in HR becoming a bottleneck for the vendor to gain access. Um, and if they do misclassify the user, uh, it can cause a number of downstream issues, including provisioning the wrong access and even potential litigation. Um, this doesn't even take into consideration the fact that creating a user in an HR solution uh, can be you know, substantially more expensive than storing it elsewhere. And because of that, you know, we see organizations move toward creating third party users directly in places like Active Directory. You know, this approach leads to orphaned accounts, nested groups, and uh, those nested groups can provide elevated access, you know, amongst other things. So organizations, they want to continue to reduce their costs, specifically when it comes to development, operations, and business processing. So they're looking to third party vendors to support uh, these objectives. Um, however, the process of onboarding users can be time consuming and inaccurate, 
Um, and by implementing a solution like Sexeta, you can push the identity uh, data collection back to the vendor, uh, which can be consumed as an authoritative source uh, that can feed your uh, identity solution. So whether you're consuming data uh, from an HR solution for internal users or Sexeta for third party users, uh, the downstream processes are the same. So your IAM solution, in, in this case, Okta, can create an identity, assign roles, and provision access to downstream solutions. So in this case, it's able to, uh, Okta is able to take data from many sources and create an identity or what we call a golden record. As some data may not be in the standard format for your organization, by simply creating a rule, um, the data can be transformed in the right format and passed into the identity cube. You know, Okta will still know how to link that, um, that transformed data uh, to the original. So in IAM, we generally believe that there is one source of truth. Um, however, I think as we all know, different applications or different domains can have uh, the source of truth for specific applications. So data mastering um, allows for all connected applications to have the same data for all attributes. And the biggest value is that consistency allows for repeatability, automation, and reduction of security blind spots. So with that said, I'd like to introduce uh, Paul DeGraff. Uh, Paul's been a leader and well-known name in the identity space for quite some time. And I personally have had the pleasure of not only hearing Paul speak about identity in the past, uh, but also you know, the ability to work alongside him in some of his uh, identity initiatives. So Paul. Can everybody hear me? How about now? can't hear myself speak so <laughs> yes there we can go. hear you Paul <laughs> all right good 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 so thank you everybody for joining I appreciate it kind of uh, so let's talk a little bit about third parties uh, and what that brings to the table and give some operational uh, advice on that as well kind of so as probably most organizations today have outsourced probably some kind of capability whether that's business processing uh, capabilities, call centers, application development or application support. I think all of us probably have some kind of capability outsourced to a third party vendor. And, and that brings risk to the organization. And as you look at some of the breaches that have occurred in the last while, um, then you can see that one in two is really impacted by a third party, where really a third party is the cause of the breach kind of, which is, Concerning, of course, for a lot of organization. And this shows sort of that traditionally organizations have implemented vendor risk management processes where vendors get assessed on their risk. But that is usually a one time deal, a one time shot. Um, and, and that in itself is already a complex process to assess the vendors, a lot of stakeholders involved. You have a legal department, security usually is involved, the procurement organization, and then the business manager that wants to hire that third party and define sometimes on what is the access that that third party needs. And that in itself is already a very complicated process. And then once the access is granted, sort of the, the business manager sort of forgets about that kind of relationship. That is the tradition that I've seen anywhere. And as Jonathan mentioned as well, the, the other piece of that is now sort of the, what I call the API economy. Like if you see, for instance, the, the Facebook breach from last year, you know, where basically vendors or third parties had access to more data than Facebook initially uh, allowed that API to do. So this is not just a, a third party issue. It will become more and more of an issue as well of how you're going to give access, whether that's through an API or through a UI interface. Kind of. So what we need to do to solve some of this problem is basically... Um, link your identity program to your vendor risk management program and, and allow for more of a continuous visibility into what third parties have access to and make sure that managers get that visibility. So next slide, please. 
So how do we accomplish that? So let's first talk a little bit about some of the challenges that brings to the table. So first of all, you have the onboarding of the third party, which is troublesome. As Jonathan mentioned, um, depending on the relationship that may be there with the third party, sometimes those things are defined in an HR system. So if you think more of staff augmentation kind of things, HR departments may be open to that. But if you have like uh, what I've dealt with in the past, like things like call centers where you have a thousand people or more kind of that need to be onboarded and also having a high turnover necessarily, that's not something that an HR organization can deal with. So that really allows for uh, a different system to manage that and potentially even let the, the third party uh, manage that themselves. So we're going to come back to that in a moment. So by linking your identity program and to your vendor is mo then the risk management program, you can do some third party risk mitigation. You get more operational view into what's going on. And, and that's important to, uh, to mitigate that risk. Um, first of all, kind of, as you look at the third parties uh, overall, that access is constantly changing. No different than as an employee. You know, when you start as an employee, you get a certain amount of uh, access, but then over time, as your role changes, as you may get a promotion, your access is going to change. And that's no different for a vendor. I have not seen in my experience anyway that from day one, a vendor has the same access as going forward, kind of, you know, if you look a year down the road, whether that vendor still has the same access. And I can tell you, I dealt with one security incident in one of my previous companies where basically the initial assessment of the vendor, which was in this case, a, a company in a foreign country that basically did development efforts for us but over time, access was given to a different application that had access to PII. And once a particular developer understood that they had access to that, they actually leveraged that information to, uh, to do some nasty things, if you will, kind of. So it's very common, you know, that a vendor access at the beginning of a contract, you know, this is has to give access to ABC. And then over time, these things change. Um, and then we never uh, take care of that uh, going forward. So uh, very important to get that visibility and provide that visibility. So through the life cycle of that vendor, basically understanding what that access is and how we continue to give access to that and validate that with the business managers to make sure that that is uh, still the right access. The other thing that is real challenging is making sure that third parties are identified as such and then we can make policy decisions based on that. So if you look at authentication, for example, without having some kind of risk classification of that third party, whether, you know, if that third party indeed has access to PII, do we may need to enforce something like multi-factor authentication? Are we gonna ask for a biometric or something like that? You know, to be able to do that requires systems that can actually uh, pass those credentials and pass that information over. So that's what we're going to discuss next, which is the solution, if you will. So next slide, please. So as discussed by Jonathan uh, a little bit already, so you have Zexita that has a nice system to managing third parties and third party identities and really give you that consolidated view of identity throughout the life cycle of that third party. So you can set policies around that and feed that into an identity management system like Okta, for example, that can then base decisions on that. So if you categorize, as you will see in the demo that will follow, you know, a, a risk categorization to a third party, you can then pass those credentials and attributes over to an Okta system, for example, and then make a decision around, hey, do I now need to do an MFA or do I now say, oh, I need some kind of workflow approval to give actually access to those resources that that third party needs access to. So that's very keen to make sure that you have that interaction between the system of record, which is Exeda, and your identity management system, which could be Okta or other solutions like that. Um, so let me see what else should we uh, mention here, kind of, uh, that I had in my list of things to discuss. Uh, the main thing is sort of the, the lifecycle management, right? To make sure that you set policies correctly. The, the one thing that I liked very much about the Zexita solution, especially for the larger players, like if you have a call center or a business process outsourcer 
or somewhere where your identities are more than 10, 20, 100, 500 maybe, or even more, that you actually have the opportunity to delegate the capability out to that third party. So you can say, hey, you are responsible for managing your workforce. And we set the policies in Zexita in combination with an Okta to say what they have access to. So allowing that ad administration to be delegated to the third party gives that third party more control over how they manage that workforce as well or who they put in because they now know that that is pretty automated workflow that is occurring to give that access to that employee where in the past, you know, tickets may have been opened and before a new person that is onboarded for a call center or something like that takes maybe days to do that. Now having that full integration, you know, they, they're, it allows for more integration and faster access to uh, resources, which allows, again, with the delegation, a far better way to manage those resources. So, so there is not benefit just on you as acquiring that solution, but also to those third parties can be more uh, dynamic in nature on how they work through these uh, capabilities. So, so the partnership between your identity management system and a solution like Zexy that can really enhance your overall security. And, and last but not least, the integration with your vendor risk management system. So having more of a continuous view into how your identities are um, appearing and what they're doing uh, is of course of great value to your vendor risk management program as well. So, so if you haven't talked to your VRM uh, uh, guys yet in your, in your organization, uh, kind of it's time to do that as you start looking at uh, Zexita potentially as a solution to help you in your uh, third party access. Go ahead. So I pass it on to the next one. Cassie, I think it's yours. All right, great. So to kind of walk through what Paul and Jonathan have talked about, I'm going to use an example. And we're gonna show what an end user experience can start to feel like when you're leveraging both Sexeta and Okta. So we'll use Nia to illustrate this. Nia works at Acme Consulting, and Acme Consulting has just been engaged for an IT project for a large corporation called Massive Dynamic. Now, Massive Dynamic has a couple of things that are going to help them with this project. They've already selected Sexeta and Okta, and then they've got a team that are ready to manage this project. So the project manager is Kai. Now, keep in mind, Kai, he's a business line user. So he's not necessarily an admin or a product owner, but he has reasons that he's going to need to be able to access portions of the life cycle of this individual, Nia, that's being brought on board. And he'll have responsibilities to make sure that her access is removed as the project ends, et cetera. Additionally, we have Amita. Now, Amita is the IAM director. So she would be the person who oftentimes is the, the tool owner in this case. So we'll use her to illustrate some of those aspects. Now, before Nia can get started for work, she has to have access to some certain systems so that she can do her job. So before her first day, she has a delegated admin, to Paul's point, that goes into the system on Sexeta's side and gets her all registered, enters her details. Now keep in mind, Massive Dynamic has made the purchase of Sexeta. They own this tool. But as part of that tool, there's the ability to have these externally facing collaboration portals. And that's where Scooter's logging in. So Scooter doesn't have to have any kind of an AD or Azure account. He doesn't have to have any kind of ability to do anything else within the massive dynamic system. He's simply there to help with the collaboration and onboarding of his group of users. So he enters in all of Nia's personal information to get things started. Now you'll notice under the background check that currently that's still in progress. We're gonna use that a little bit later to drive some different decisions in our workflow. Now, massive dynamic has a policy in place. And that policy is before they allow anybody into their ecosystem or allow any kind of an access grant, they want to have those individuals prove out their identity. So once Scooter enters all of Nia's details, that mobile phone number that he entered into the system, she'll receive a notification on that phone that she needs to prove out her identity. 
When she clicks on the link, Nia is going to be walked through the ability to prove out her identity. So first and foremost, she's going to scan the, first, the front and the back of her ID. And then she's going to be asked to take a selfie and guide it through the process. Once that's done, we're going to compare biometrically the image that was captured to that ID image, basically ensuring that the person in front of the device is the person that's being represented. And then we're going to extract that information from the ID to make sure that that's matching up with the profile that we're creating. So once all of those checks have been completed and Nia has been verified, her workflow is going to proceed forward. And all of that information so far is going to be passed over to Kai for fulfillment. Now, if we remember, Kai is our business line user, not necessarily an admin. So he gets in here and he's going to be able to tell us things about Nia and the work that she needs to do for his project. First, he'll be able to review any of the information sent over by Scooter, Nia's delegated admin. And he could add in other sponsors or, you know, other people that might have some step of approval that has to occur. In this case, Kai is able to do the entire sign off. Next, he's going to review some information directly related to the project. So you'll notice up at the top, interestingly, this project is set to end tomorrow. Now, some of the other things that have been assigned are things like the job code here or on the last screen, you saw a unique identifier. Those pieces of information are being systematically assigned via the Sexeta platform. So for that unique identifier, we're comparing not just the information housed in Sexeta, but we'd likely have a feed from those HR systems or any other tools that are an authoritative source for another group of individuals and ensure that we're assigning a truly unique identifier as we bring Nia on board. Keep in mind, this is Nia's first exposure to Massive Dynamic, so this would be her first onboarding experience. Now, the other thing we see here at the bottom are a few questions. Is company provided training required? Is this work going to be on-prem? Does she need any kind of remote access? These questions would lead us to be able to populate things like IT service desk tickets. So do we need to get her a ticket in the system so that she has a badge and can get into a facility? Do we need to get her signed up for some kind of training before she's gonna be able to you know, access one of our facilities or you know, potentially you have places that are of a higher security clearance and she needs to process some kind of a, a security course first. All of those things can be created and sent downstream. Now, in this case, we'll notice most of them are no, but she is asking for remote access. So once Kai has filled that out and submitted it, you'll notice that the sex at a platform is applying policy. So Kai may not have any insight to what Massive Dynamics policies are, but the system still can enforce them. So in this case, Massive Dynamic has a policy that in order to grant remote access, they have to be have a successful background check. And in order for Kai to continue onboarding Nia, he has to either submit for an exception, so in this case, that would reroute this ticket over to his enterprise security team, or he has to wait until that uh, background check comes back as cleared. In this case, he's selected to go ahead and route that over to enterprise security, and we'll assume that they're gonna go ahead and let her proceed forward because they can see that that uh, that background check is pending and likely to come through shortly. Now at this point, this is the first time that Nia has a completed and active, if you'll notice the status, profile inside of SecZeta. So at this point in time, we're able to measure the risk that Nia poses to, to Massive Dynamic. In this case, it's been evaluated to be very low. Now we'll keep that in mind as we move forward and we talk about more of her access and what she needs to do downstream because that'll become important there. So at that point in time with that successfully created active profile, Okta can receive all of the attributes via API that have been entered into Sexeta. And one of those attrib attributes will be that risk score. So based on that risk score and the information that Okta's learned, Okta would be able to provision accounts and ultimately grant access to Nia on her first day. Now, because Nia has been evaluated as a low risk, on her first day when she goes to access those applications, she'd be able to go into the Okta portal, click over, and would likely not incur any kind of a prompt for multi-factor at this point in time. Now, what else is going on in the background? Well, 
it's great that you have good information when you set up a profile, but how about as the relationship continues on? So Saxeta is also proactively maintaining that information. And I don't mean just the profile, right? I mean the relationship that has actually led to Nia being granted access into this ecosystem. So Saxeta reach, reaches back out to Acme Corporation and Nia's delegated admin, Scooter, to make sure that she's still employed, to make sure that she should still be working on this engagement, and to ensure that sponsors and things of that nature are accurate. Now, any of these questions can be, you know, changed as far as what their, the process is for Massive Dynamic or the onboarding specifically. But the point is we're proactively ensuring that the relationship that led to Nia being brought into system and the resulting access is still active. Now, all of this is dynamic. So let's say that pending background check of Nia's, it didn't come back. Or perhaps, you know, as we get close to that contract expiration date, we've set up a policy that says if they don't have an, a renewal on that contract, that their risk starts to increase. Any attribute that we collect on an individual inside the sex data system can have an impact on their risk score. And all of that measurement is done dynamically. Similarly to Paul's point earlier, any information that's been collected about the risk of the organization as a whole, so Acme Corp, is also ingested and applied at Nia's personal level. So maybe Acme Corp experienced some kind of a breach that morning. Whatever it is, Nia's score has been increased and she's now considered high risk. That information would be automatically sent downstream and that could impact things like authentication policies. So in this case, when Nia goes to access those same applications, she might be stopped and prompted for an MFA, you know, that biometric pass, whatever it might be that's in place before she's allowed to proceed forward and do her job. Now, let's say it's officially 813 and Nia's contract, if you'll remember, ends on the 12th. There's lots of things that we could have been doing leading up to this, sending notifications to the vendor management team, ensuring that they're updating any contracts as they, as they see fit. You know, we could be reaching out to the external organization, letting them know that their contract end date is coming up and, you know, wanting, asking for information back about status of the project itself. But the point is we can drive workflow off of this. And in this case, the workflow that Amita, the IAM director has put in place is that she wants no third party users to have any kind of access if there's not a current contract that's granting that access. So on 813, Nia's profile would be switched to inactive and that status would be sent downstream to whatever systems are granting access. So in this case, Okta would receive a notification that Nia has been deactivated. And ultimately that would mean all of her access to those applications would be denied. Now, what happens if Nia changes companies? Uh, as we know, some of these large corporations, it's very common for people to change status. Maybe they move from one consulting company to another. Maybe they change from being a consultant to being an employee. How do you keep track of all of that in one place? And how do you know if something happened where maybe Nia was terminated for cause and you don't want to have her re-enter your ecosystem? Well, all of that's tracked inside of Sexeta as well. So if you'll notice, her unique identifier, that, that number that we assigned her when she initially engaged with Massive Dynamic, that stays the same. And tied to that unique identifier is her entire auditable history. Everything that she's done while she was at Acme Corp, everything that she does moving forward as she moves to XYZ Corp. All of that's saved there, as well as the people that had any interaction with her profile. So it's very easy to go back in and see what happened. And if at any point in time there is termination for cause, that can be flagged in the system and systematically we can deny access or deny onboarding for NIA downstream. And with that, I'll pass it back to Jonathan to kind of wrap things up. All right, thanks, Cassie. You know, I, and I hope what Cassie, Paul, and I provided, you know, has been informative. 
Um, but more importantly, that you can see that with Sexeta fronting workflows and Okta providing access to applications and ultimately security source providing guidance implementation services, you know, you can be on a better path to securing and maturing your identity program. So thank you. Thank you guys. All right. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. Okay. So we do have a question. Um, let's see. How hard would it be to implement a solution like this? Who do you want to answer that question? Uh, whatever. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can talk about it kind of if you want. Okay. Kind of. So, so, so it, it's a bit of an open question, but in the sense of, um, you know, how hard is it? It's not hard to implement. The main thing that we learned during our implementation was there were so many features available that, you know, you start small kind of so in our case um, that we did was a call center uh, onboarding um, if you will so as long as you know what you want to achieve out of the system it wasn't hard to do and even with a little bit of help of professional services from Zexita itself it, it wasn't hard to do I mean that just like any new system you need to get familiar with the nomenclature uh, that they use and sort of how do you, how you configure a particular system but once that was understood um it, it wasn't hard to do the the main thing is to get that integration going with the likes of after or sale point or whatever your provisioning system is uh for that matter to do that api integration which was relatively easy uh to do if you're familiar with api integration uh, if you will um, but really understanding what are the conditions so as you saw in the demo there were a couple of conditions or policies that were executed behind the scenes if you will so there was a workflow approval that you saw for hey we set a policy that if it's outside of that policy it needs to do an escalation so really understanding the workflow that you want to implement is really very important so it's really first do a, a process map of what you want to do and then see how the solution can uh, implement that but i would suggest start small with a small vendor that you want to bring on to test the solution out uh, but the main thing is really understanding what is that process and who all needs to approve if there are approval, whether that's financial approval or uh, notifications, right? I mean, the one thing that you always see is that managers forget that contract ends. So we always had problems that, you know, we shut down access, as you saw in the demo as well, that if that end date came, we shut down access. If nobody took notice of the notifications, we could send as many notifications as we wanted, but if nobody acts on it, that access is going to be shut down, right? So to really educate the organization on what that brings to the table, it's not just, hey, we can onboard you faster, but we can also offboard you faster, kind of, uh, if you will. And that's usually uh, good from a security perspective, but from a business perspective, maybe, you know, certain approvals weren't done in time. So really understanding your overall process on how would you onboard a particular third party that's really what drives um, your time to implement. But for us, it was a, a couple of weeks to implement this for our, some of our call centers. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question came in. Does SecZeta work with Azure, Azure AD Connect? Yep, it sure does. So actually we have a partner portal that is Azure AD Connect um, powered. And we are just finishing up the integration there. So something that we're very familiar with. Okay, great. Okay, let's see any other questions. Um, okay, uh, one more. Um, you, may men you mentioned this earlier in the presentation, but what are the benefits of a third-party management system? Sure, I could start that one and then anybody else can add on. Um, 
the biggest piece, and I think it was Jonathan that actually covered this, is HR systems aren't necessarily purpose-built for third parties. So some of the specific workflows or unique processes that it takes to get on a third-party user isn't necessarily supported. Now, in addition to that, HR solutions can be incredibly expensive per seat. So from a cost perspective, it might be prohibitive, and it puts a burden of management back into HR. And they may or may not have much interaction with these third parties or any knowledge of what they're actually required to do. So that can be incredibly complex for them to try and keep, keep a grasp on. In addition to that, if they did make an error, there was somehow some misclassification made from you know, a contractor or employee standpoint, litigation for misclassification is very common. You know, depending on the vertical, I know a lot of our healthcare cus customers face this frequently. So um, having a separate system purpose built to manage those individuals at a cost point that's much more reflective of what they actually need and with the ability to integrate to all of those same downstream systems and you know, prevent any confusion around litigation or, or misclassification and, and kind of help with the unique processes can be incredibly beneficial. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I think, you know, we've talked a lot about risk and, um, you know, issues around that aspect, but, you know, operational costs are, are definitely a big thing to consider. You know, we're talking about onboarding vendors and, you know, having your, your support desk or your admins or whomever uh, manage uh, access. It becomes a cumbersome task um, for them where they can be focused on, you know, more relevant and, and that valuable um, aspects of your organization. So if you're able to, to push that back to the vendor and build policies uh, around that um, and automate that process, it can drastically reduce uh, the operational costs as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. last but not least, if I may add, is also the organizational structures, right? So your HR organization may not want to manage those people kind of, uh, I worked for many organizations where, where HR organizations were very clear that this is not their business. We're not in the business of managing third parties. So it could be that they are, but um, most ones that I've worked with or worked for uh, were not really supportive in managing, especially the larger entities kind of, uh, if you will. Okay, great. Any other questions? Can you give an example of how you would make a case to bring on a solution like this to your team to be on board? The, the business case we made, kind of, if I may, when we acquired it at the, one of my former companies was really around the complexity of onboarding third parties, how long it took uh, thing. In this case, the company was a very seasonal business. So normally say in our call centers, we would have a couple of hundred people, but then at the beginning, the end of the year into the first quarter of the year, we would staff up to a thousand, 1200 people. And you know the, the way it took so long to get those people onboarded um, was really the, the productivity driver to, to get that going. And if we looked at the cost to improve versus the benefit that we got to it, it was actually a pretty easy sell to just show what the, the key benefits are. But, you know, you need your business sponsor as well, kind of. So it is good to talk to the people that are actually managing that relationship and seeing what the challenges are. If, if today you have some kind of ticketing process to get people onboarded in third parties and that usually takes days, if not weeks sometimes, kind of, uh, especially if you have audit failures in offboarding, kind of, for example, uh, as you do your access recertification processes, if you're in a regulated industry, then usually your third parties are where the problems uh, occur. So those kind of things are good to use for justification of, um, you know, acquiring solution uh, like that. Yeah, and, and there's, you know, there's other, you know, just to add kind of what Paul was, was saying here, it's, you know, the way that we look at it, security source is really, we tie everything to business objectives, right? And, you know, 
the reality is, is everything we do as an organization needs to be in service of, let's say, driving revenue. Um, so as we look at things, we need to say, okay, well, how can we reduce cost? How do we reduce spend? And how can we help drive revenue? And if we can identify what those objectives are and how we can meet the service of those objectives, we can easily provide um, you know, value for, for purchasing or for moving into a, uh, a program like this. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we look at, you know, if you just look at IT just, you know, not too long ago, you know, it was just considered a money pit, right? And it was just throw money at IT until we realized that, listen, we're providing services uh, to the organization. So the same thing happens here is we can reduce operational costs, we can reduce risk. That's all tied to financial aspects of the organization. Um, simple BVA uh, can provide that value. Okay, great. Um, let's see, I don't see any other questions. So with that, um, I will thank you all for attending today's webinar. Uh, in the next couple of days, you will receive an email with a recording of today's webinar and slides. Um, if you had any questions that weren't answered, um, there will be a link in the email for you to submit your questions or to set up a time to speak directly with one of our specialists. I also wanted to say a very special thank you to Paul, Jonathan, and Cassie for your time today. So thank you guys and have a great day.